children drinking out of toilets, the reported conditions at a Clive, Texas border detention center have been shameful. Now PETA is doing a small but kind gesture to show solidarity and offer aid to migrants on their American journey. This week, PETA Latino members will be outside a migrant respite center in Brownsville, distributing free vegan ice cream and soy milk to those leaving the shelter. Many Latinos are lactose intolerant, and the soy products will be welcome. It will also be free of saturated animal fat and cholesterol and spares animals in the dairy industry where it's common for cows and calves to be separated at birth. PETA's position on the border situation hasn't changed from the beginning of the child separations that began in July 2018. PETA's put up billboards critical of the policy and delivered soy milk to detention centers. For this week, the PETA podcast reprises this episode, where PETA VP Alka Chanda, herself an immigrant, explains the need for compassion. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, PETA takes a stand on the southern border with two billboards showing a mother cow's love for her children and claiming that separating cows or any animals from their children is no different than the government separating children from migrant families. You know, there are two responses. One is to open your heart and say, yes, of course cows love their offspring. Of course the mother cow loves her child. And yes, of course, she shouldn't be separated from her children. So that's one response. And the other one is to close up tight and say, wait a second, we're not them. Dr. Alka Chanda, a PETA vice president and an immigrant herself, talks about how it doesn't matter the species. Separating children from parents isn't right. You know, although I immigrated here quite a while ago, you know, I'm, I'm still not white. And so I still carry the burden of being seen as the other in a predominantly white society. Uh, So when I see those children being taken away from their parents, I do see it as a devaluation of the meaning of a bond in a non-white family. So I do take it personally. Anybody with a heart, you know, understands that what's going on is just beyond unethical. More with Chanda, and we'll hear PETA President Ingrid Newkirk's response to critics about PETA's billboards next on The PETA Podcast. But first, thanks again for joining us here at The PETA Podcast. Please share a link with your friends and let them know the animals have a voice on The PETA Podcast. Go to our webpage at PETA.org and listen to all the episodes. There's the first episode with PETA President and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk, who debunks all the myths you've heard about PETA and animal rights. Know the difference between animal experimentation for regulation and testing for curiosity's sake? Uh, Both kill animals needlessly, but listen to episodes 23, 20, and 11 for some insight on the differences. And if you're wondering how racism and speciesism go hand in hand, listen to PETA's chief counsel Jeff Kerr in episode 2. Get all our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you catch your podcast. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. Ingrid Newkirk saw the news of the last few weeks and saw the connection. What was happening to immigrant families with the government's zero tolerance policy at the southern border, separating mothers from their children, include those as young as two and three years old. It was no different from what the meat and dairy industry does to cows, separating mothers from their calves. PETA placed two billboards in California and Arizona along the southern border to Mexico. And it shows a cow nuzzling a calf and the phrase, loving mothers and their children 
should never be separated. Please go vegan. There was a commotion on Twitter about it, and Newkirk responded with this statement. PETA believes that all these issues are united under one principle. Of course, many people will reject the idea that injustice applies to anyone other than themselves or those they closely relate to or what is politically correct right now, just as many people historically have rejected any comparison between whites and blacks or able-bodied people and people with disabilities and so on throughout history. It is our job to say, no, it isn't just about one or two sets of humans. It's about a mindset. We should be against all discrimination and unfairness and the separation of any loving mothers from their infants. This is a teaching opportunity, and we would be negligent to ignore it despite any flack we may receive. Our message is just and right. We will be strong, be unembarrassed, be unashamed, be on the side of justice for all. The words of Ingrid Newkirk from a statement on the separation of children from their families at the border as being no different from the way animals are treated and exploited in the dairy industry where young calves are taken from their mothers. Ingrid Newkirk, president and co-founder of PETA, and the statement by her on the separation of children from their families at the border as being no different from the way animals are treated and exploited in the dairy industry where young calves are taken from their mothers. So the news makes it a good opportunity to talk to Dr. Alka Chanda, a vice president at PETA and herself, an immigrant twice. She came from India to Canada and from Canada to the United States. And she talks how the news and PETA's statement affected her personally. All that on this episode of the PETA Podcast. All right, tell me about this, uh, you know, the, the news uh, in the last couple of weeks. The whole world has watched the story about children being separated from their parents at the U.S. southern border. And I understand that PETA has actually donated soy milk to the facilities where children are housed. Uh, tell me about that. What do you know about that? And why, why soy milk? Uh, Yes, that's exactly correct, Emil. Um, People may not know that between 50 and 80 percent of Latinos, uh, and this is according to the National Institutes of Health, between 50 and 80 percent of Latinos are actually lactose intolerant. Uh, So we were very concerned that all of these hapless children who have been placed unethically in detention away from their parents um, are perhaps not being given proper nutrition or nutrition that would suit their bodies and their physiological needs. Um, So while our government uh, tries to get its act in order uh, to do what's ethically correct by these parents who were only seeking asylum and the children who were wrongfully taken away from them in a very unethical manner, uh, PETA thought that we should step in and at least provide some nutrition for these children. Boy, that's pretty high. 80% could possibly lactose intolerant? Uh, Yeah, that's the figure that we got from the NIH, uh, you know, and they track these sorts of things, you know, what populations uh, can, uh, are able to tolerate and not able to tolerate uh, um, something like cow's milk. But, you know, in a lot of ways, that's not that surprising, uh, given that cow's milk is, of course, intended for baby baby calves uh, and not for humans. Um, You know, it would be considered a foreign substance when we take it into our bodies. And there are uh, certain proteins that our bodies respond to negatively. Um, You know, even people who seem to be able to digest dairy, uh, cow's milk, um, actually have some reaction that they're not immediately uh, aware of. And then that becomes um, known in longer term uh, negative responses in the body to that that compound. So even if uh, I mean, I know that Asians and Asian Americans generally are known to be lactose intolerant. Um, I, and maybe I know that because I'm Asian American. I didn't know that was true when it came to Latino populations. But your explanation makes sense when you consider if it is this foreign substance, 
you know, maybe to to some degree, we all are lactose intolerant. Some are just more so than others, or to to a greater degree, and display the the impacts of of eating dairy. So maybe the the message also is stay away from dairy. I think that's a fair statement. Um, you know, to say that dairy is going to be problematic uh, health wise to everyone, all human beings, um, because it is not intended for human beings. You know, I like what one medical doctor says where he says that um, uh, when you think about what cow's milk is, you know, this is a product that's intended to take a small baby calf and turn him or her into a massive cow in a relatively short period. Um, You know, I don't know that many people who want to have that sort of conversion happen in their bodies. Uh, And it's not just that this is going to be a a, um, substance, a product that has uh, excessive calories and a lot of sugar. Um, but you know, when, when, uh, uh, people investigate things like, uh, carcinogens, dairy, cow's milk actually figures pretty prominently in the list of, uh, carcinogenic, um, compounds that we might consume. A lot of the, the, the kids who are taken away, well, they're of all ages. I guess if you are, say, above two or three, you know, it's it's more critical because you, you may be drinking milk and soy milk would be a great thing. But what about formula or what about the, the infants, those who m- might still be breastfeeding? What happens to them? I, I mean, I haven't really heard much about infants. I've, I think I've heard that some of the uh, the children were as young as maybe three. But what what is your information, Ben? Yeah, it's just a catastrophic situation. And I remember a couple of weeks ago uh, um, that there was uh, the really shocking news that there were secret facilities being built around or, or opened around the country, I should say, where very young uh, infants were being housed after being separated from their parents. Uh, and so, yes, you're absolutely mm-hmm. correct. Um, you know, these infants could well have been breastfeeding. And, you know, I... <laughs> Yeah, given the way all of this has unfolded, it's 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 very difficult to imagine that the government has anything in place for those infants um, who are suffering, as you point out, not only uh, great psychological trauma being taken away from their parents, but in addition to that, uh, they are going to be physiologically harmed tremendously for the fact that I would guess that the government doesn't have anything in place for them, uh, and it is you know something that has really ripped out the hearts of Americans and, as you pointed out, people around the world. Uh, and so, yeah, something has to be done here. I mean, you know, re- reunification as quickly as possible. And this soy milk uh, delivery from PETA is really an act of, is a humanitarian act. Uh, one, one thing this week uh, PETA did was place an ad that references this separation I've seen the ad. It's it's. I've seen it on the on the internet. Describe the ad. It's being placed at some of the border towns um, along the southern border of the U.S., uh, Tucson, Arizona, and a place in California. And um, the billboard shows a mother cow with her calf. Yeah, I have it here in front of me. Loving mothers and their children should never be separated. Please go vegan, and then the PETA right, logo. Yes. And a, a shot of a, a mother cow uh, kissing or, I, I don't know, I guess, nuzzling her, her calf. And it's a, it is a, a quite, a, quite a billboard. And yet, this billboard is causing some, some news. What kind of reaction ha- have you seen to the billboard? Um, well, you know, I have to say that I'm flummoxed by the reaction because it seems to be a pretty universal message that people should understand. You know, and I'll preface this by saying that, um, you know, I personally as an immigrant have just been horrified by what's going on, you know, along with um, many, many others uh, here in the U.S. and around the world, just horrified by what's going on. And uh, just recently, I attended one of the um, Families Belong Together rallies uh, here in Washington, D.C., and there are about 30,000 people there. And I remember being at the rally yeah. and just thinking, how wonderful is this that, you know, even in this time of great division in our country, that all of these people, these tens of thousands of people here, and I think there were 700 cities that participated 
in similar demonstrations to say uh, what is happening is wrong. And I thought, what a wonderful thing that all of these people recognize that families belong together um, and that it's wrong to tear loving families apart. And so PETA's message is essentially that, you know, what we all recognize to be true um, as caring individuals, we recognize that loving families should be together. Uh, but of course, as we also know, um, most people don't know what goes on in some of these industries, you know, whether it's the dairy industries where calves are ripped away from their mothers, um, usually when they're about a day old. Uh, and certainly within a week of being born, they're ripped away from their mothers permanently. And so, you know, PETA's role then becomes to step in and show what people are not aware of because the industry, you know, isn't uh, putting out ads saying, we rip babies away from their mothers and that's how you get the milk. Yeah. But that's the subtext and, you know, of what goes on and that's what consumers need to know. So it's actually a pretty apt comparison that, you know, dairy cows are going through the same kind of thing that, that, uh, that these immigrant families are going through and not to just, to, well, I'm not trying to complicate things, but it's not just dairy cows. But if you look all up and down the spectrum in terms of what animal rights activists are fighting for, you see the orcas at SeaWorld, they are, are separated from their, uh, their, their children at, at birth. And in the and and then force into this life of exploitation and entertainment, not to mention the bears and the bear calves. And it just seems to be, you know, no matter what the species, separation of the of the children from the parent is it's something that the bad guys do. Precisely. And it's yes, as you say, Emil, it's something that's across all of these industries. I work on laboratory issues and we see baby monkeys being taken away from their mothers. And it's just a matter of protocol. It's convenient for the industry for them to remove the babies. And then the mothers go on as breeding machines. You know, and that's what happens in the dairy industry as well. And across, you know, across the board in factory farming, the babies are ripped away from their mothers right after they're born. You know, people think about the gestation crates where the mother pigs are held. Um, you know, for their entire lives while they go from the gestation crate to the farrowing crate and then back to the gestation crate and then the farrowing crate on and on. And that's their lives. Um, and yes, there is absolutely no regard by the industry uh, for the fact that these are families. Um, you know, I'm Indian. And so uh, in Hindu tradition, we regard the cow. We say, um, you know, that she is the mother. Because the love of a mother cow is is uh, legendary. It's 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 the it's epic in Indian Indian tradition. Just like biblically, we talk about the mother hen, and so we have for millennia understood that animals, non human animals, uh, the mothers care deeply for their young and are so protective of their young, and yet these industries take all of that historical knowledge, things that you can see if you have eyes, and um, just throw it all away and treat these animals like they're unfeeling machines. They're only to serve the bottom and, line. Yeah, and it, it seems also that, you know, bringing up this connection between mother and child, this family connection that exists in and not just cows, but orcas and bears and all these other animals and how they're separated. Well, it really doesn't matter about species. And if we understand this about human beings, uh, we should be able to understand it about animals and vice versa. And yet here, when it comes to the border, it seems like we've, we've done the probably the most unethical and most heinous thing we can do to really uh, uh, really interrupt that bond, mother and child, family and child, in the name of what immigration law, in the name of Trump administration zero tolerance policy. I mean, it it just seems inhumane. I, I I agree, and I think it plays into what has been going on with the administration, where they, you know, the word is dehumanize, 
Um, you know, that's what we're hearing and we hear, you know, when right from the beginning, you know, rapists and murderers, um, you know, not the best, you know, that language that denigrates, and I think that's the correct word, that denigrates uh, individuals and whole populations, you know, that's what the current administration has done and the actions at the border reflect that denigration of life, that denigration of relationships, that uh, commodification that we care so much about this um, this supposed security, you know, without even acknowledging what our role was in making all of these people flee from their countries, uh, you know, the drug war and, you know, the whole history of hegemony in Central and South America. So we just discard all of that history, discard all of that responsibility, treat these human beings like they're uh, that like they don't have feelings, like they don't have love for their children, that there's not a family bond. We're doing it with the human beings at the southern border. We do it with animals every single day in industries across the board throughout this country. And by the millions um, and tens of millions, actually probably hundreds of millions now that I think of chickens, um, and really billions, right. it's, it's, just, it's just a nightmare uh, beyond our worst imaginings. So now we have this billboard that PETA has put up along the border, and people are seeing it, the me media is seeing it, noticing it, they're putting it up on on uh, their Twitter feeds, the the billboard of a, a cow, a mother cow, and her calf, she's nuzzling her calf, and the caption is, loving mothers and their children should never be separated, please go vegan, and then the PETA logo. And we talked about how the critics have seen this and are accusing PETA of comparing immigrant children to cows as if that is a criticism. I don't know, is this accurate you know, or is, is it a, a valid criticism for PETA to compare immigrant children to cows? Is that something that we should be uh, up in arms with or is it just a kind of a reverse political correctness on the part of some media critics? I think it's just a deliberate failure to understand, you know, when people don't want to look at their own actions, you know, there might be people who are offended by what's going on at the southern border. And to them, I say thank you. And I respect that. And I think it's, it speaks really well of people when they acknowledge that there's uh, something atrocious, there's an atrocity going on, you know, and maybe there are people who see that atrocity but don't want to look at their own role in another atrocity that's going on. So it's possible that people will reject PETA's message because they don't want to take a good hard look at where um, their behaviors, you know, what they choose to put in their bodies or, you know, uh, other um, lifestyle practices that they engage in where that might create an atrocity. They don't want to look at it. You know, so it's easier to dismiss PETA and, uh, you know, say something like, oh, you're um, denigrating these human beings and saying they're like animals. You know, there are a lot of things to say. Number one, we are animals, so we, <laughs> we should remember our elementary yeah. biology and embrace the fact that we are animals. You know, when we're talking about this criticism about comparing immigrant children to cows and, oh, how the certain members of the media and certain segments of success of society are so indignant about that. I think we just need to remember what, what uh, PETA president Ingrid Newkirk said, I guess I'm paraphrasing or when she said, uh, a man is a pig is a rat is a boy. You know, we're talking about how we are in the same boat and I don't get the criticism, frankly. We're all the same. We can all suffer. Um, we all feel pain. And, you know, that is really the, the, basis of the PETA philosophy, you know, that why we believe, why we, um, why we know that animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, or use in entertainment for the fact that we all suffer, we all feel pain, we're all individuals with our own interests apart from how somebody might be able to exploit us. So you have the current administration exploiting the people who are coming in from the southern border and wanting to further a political agenda, you know, based on racism and hatred of the other. 
uh, you know, and that's what we're seeing there. Uh, and meanwhile, there are industries um, who exploit animals because we want to, because there's this desire to use those animals, exploit those animals for our own ends. And PETA's basic point is all individuals des- deserve respect, whether they're human beings or non humans. Yeah, it doesn't matter what species. Yeah. So, Alka, I know this is a personal issue for you because you yourself are an immigrant to the U.S. And in fact, you're a double immigrant <laughs> because you immigrated first to Canada. I, I Tell me about your personal uh, feelings about this story. Uh, just when you first heard it and you saw uh, how it just kept building with the, the ad that PETA put out and, and the reaction to that ad. You know, certainly I feel a lot of resonance with uh, immigrant populations because, as you point out, uh, I was um, just under three years old. I was about a month shy for my um, third birthday when my family and I immigrated to Canada from India. Um, And then I moved to the U.S. about 20 years ago. And, you know, whenever there's like a shakeup, um, you know, I, I, I'm concerned, you know, as an immigrant, uh, you know, yeah. and of course, I mean, but you were three years old when you first came from India to Canada. Can, can you imagine how, when you first came, if you were taken from your parents, from your mother at that time? Yeah, no, I, I can't, I, 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 I no, I, I don't want to think about it. Um, it, it's just, I, I mean, not- I have three children and. It's been a while since they've been three, but if they were ever taken away, I don't know, maybe now I would, you know, have to think about it. But <laughs> back then, I know I would, <laughs> back then, I know I'd be, I'd be horrified. I mean, I, and just knowing where, where are they? I'd be, I'd be worried sick. I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself. And, you know, the idea of what, what the, the parents must be going through. Fighting the law on the one hand, fighting the immig- in the immigration court, and then fighting this immigrate, you know, this you know, this reunification issue. Ah, Absolutely. and so there you were as a three year old in Canada. Yeah, and I should ex- yeah. yeah I should explain that you know, um, so so I came to, I moved to Canada in 1966, and at that time, uh, people from non white countries uh, could only immigrate to Canada if they were pursuing higher education or professionals. Uh, so there was sort of a, a, a bar that non-whites had to um, step over in order for them to be permitted into Canada. You know, a, a level of racism was part of my coming to Canada. It was already there. And then it was very much right. part of the society, um, you know, especially back in the 60s and the 70s. And I remember when I was um, 16 years old, my older sister was going to university then, and she used to bring home these alternative weekly papers, and I would read those. And uh, it was sort of like the height of um, of uh, racism against uh, people from the Indian diaspora. And so there were anti-racism demonstrations in Toronto, and then there were pro-racism <laughs> demonstrations in Toronto. <laughs> and so I remember, this is where it links to everything that we're talking about here, Emil. I remember that there was a pro-racism rally in Toronto, and there was a person who was wearing a gorilla costume who was holding a sign that said, I want my rights too. So I was 16, uh, which means this was about 1979. Um And so this was like before PETA started. It was before I knew that there was something called the animal rights movement. It was before I even, you know, self-identified as somebody uh, who believed in animal rights. You know, I hadn't read Peter Singer's Animal Liberation. But I remember looking at that photograph and thinking, you know, rather than like, I didn't think, oh, my gosh, he's comparing me to a gorilla. I thought, why shouldn't gorillas have rights? Like, what a weird sign. Like, of course, gorillas should have rights. Of course, they should be left alone. So I think that when you see things like PETA's billboard, you know, there are two responses. One is to open your heart and say, yes, of course, cows love their offspring. Of course, the mother cow loves her child. 
Um, and yes, of course, she shouldn't be separated from her children. So that's one response. And the other one is to close up tight and say, wait a second, we're not them, you know, and to denigrate right. um, cows and any other species, you know, for fear of whatever you're afraid of. But I think the loving approach is the or, better you, one. You know, yeah, or to find the negative. I mean, I, I can relate to that as a Filipino and my, my father first came to America in the, in the 20s. He was called monkey. And some people would say, oh, well, that was, a, you know, that was to denigrate him as an Asian monkey. But I can see also where, you know, and if you want to put him down, if that's your stance, yeah, that's bad. But uh, on another level, you know, it, to, to say that uh, a, a person is like a monkey when you compare them with these other positive aspects, like, oh, look how smart the monkey is or look how you know, how caring or how, you know, how, how the, the monkey treats uh, his family member, you know, that's, that's a positive, that's not a negative. So I think we need to see the context before we just, you know, automatically in a knee jerk way say, Oh, he's comparing us to this, <laughs> or, you know, we're comparing these immigrants to cows. Right. It's a, uh, yeah, not long ago. I can't remember, like maybe it was about seven or eight years ago there was a politician in Virginia who called out an Indian reporter and said, called him Macaca, um, which, you know, Macaque. Monkey. Oh, yeah. And, of course, like the politician was being racist. But, you know, I've, I've, I've watched a lot of monkeys and I've read a lot about monkeys. You know, they're very <laughs> empathetic. Yeah. You know, they put themselves in harm's way rather than um, uh, see, you know, their compatriot being harmed. There are a lot of qualities about monkeys, which I wish we had as human beings. You know, we're not like that. We're not as caring. We don't deprive ourselves if it means that somebody else um, uh, is not going to get hurt. Uh, but monkeys do. So yeah. <laughs> I say embrace your inner monkey. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's all context. Yeah. You know, like I remember when the monkey is a good thing to use because people... Uh, sometimes when it's used in this way where it's an epithet and oh my goodness, you know, and I, and I, as you know, like, because that was what my, they call my father. I was kind of really kind of my, my dander goes up, but you know, if it's said about the positive aspects of the monkey King, oh, well then, <laughs> yeah. Alka, I just want to ask you one uh, final question. When you hear the stories about the immigrant children being separated, you really do feel it in a special way because you're an immigrant even though it's been years since you actually immigrated here? Oh, yes. Um, you know, although I immigrated here quite a while ago, um, you know, I'm, I'm still not white. And so I still carry the burden of being seen as the other in a predominantly white society. Uh, so when I see those children being taken away from their parents, I do see it as a devaluation of the meaning of a bond in a non-white family. Um, so I do take it personally, um, and it is Im impacting. You know, I, I think any, and I, I don't mean to set myself apart, I think anybody with a heart, anybody with a sense of consciousness, you know, understands that what's going on is um, just beyond unethical. Tell me about how you felt when you saw the the note that, Peter President and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk wrote. She uh, sent it to uh, to to people within PETA. Tell me what you thought when you saw her response to the critics about the billboard. And almost immediately after reading it, I wrote back and I said, "Hallelujah," because my heart just swelled with pride that PETA is an organization that will do what's unpopular to say what's right. Uh, you know, there are other animal groups out there, and I respect, you know, anyone who does anything to make this a kinder world for animals who suffer so greatly uh, because of human tyranny. But what I really love about PETA, you know, what I've loved about PETA since I <laughs> volunteered for the organization when I was an undergraduate in, uh, at university, back in the mid-80s, um, what I've always loved is this uh, fact that, you know, certain things are non-negotiable. You know, it is not negotiable that animals are not ours. They are not ours. 
you know, and they deserve to live a life free from harassment. And it is it is the case that we live in a society that puts humans above everybody else and in which non-human animals are um, treated in abysmal ways and killed. They have everything taken from them, um, you know, for the most trivial, trivial purposes. And for an organization like PETA to, to draw the line and say, this is a line that shall not be crossed, I think is exactly what the world needs, you know, and exactly what's needed to transform our society and societies around the world uh, so that we recognize that animals are not ours to eat, not ours to wear, not ours to experiment on, and not ours to exploit in any way. So, yeah, I, I, I was so happy to see that unapologetic line, that line that said, we are in this for the animals, we will raise our voices, and we will say what's so. And uh, so, yeah, I, I have always been inspired by PETA and Ingrid Newkirk and inspired by the message that the organization brings to the world. And I think, um, yeah, and it's, 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 it's a source of great pride for me to be able to be part of the work that PETA does. Tell me w- one last uh, thing about the, the soy milk delivery to the border. Has there been any pushback? Uh, has, the, the, has the milk gotten to the children in the, in the facilities where they're housed? Is it, uh, how's it, is it, has it been successful getting that milk to the children, the soy milk? Yes, I saw uh, an update about that this morning, Emil, and I saw that the milk has arrived and it was welcomed with open arms. Um, you know, the humanitarian workers uh, who are working there uh, at these facilities where the children have uh, been housed for now are really grateful for any help. And I saw notes from the uh, folks from PETA Latino who delivered the milk um, saying that it was very moving for them to be there and to see the children and to see the humanitarian workers uh, and to know that, um, you know, in this small way, we would be helping. Alka Chen, uh, newly minted PETA Vice President. Congratulations on that. (laughs) Thank you. It's such a great honor. And thank you for being a guest on the podcast. Thank you so much, Emil. As always, it was very nice chatting with you. Dr. Alka Channa, a PETA vice president and an immigrant herself, talking about PETA's stand on the southern border strategy of stripping children from migrant families. And as I speak, the reunification deadline has yet to be met. Children are still separated and not reunified, and the cruel, inhumane treatment continues. You can take action by going to PETA.org. And that's our show this time out. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amat or on AMOK.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. It's as simple as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. Music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.